Lord yeah. gosh. I, I told you. We don't play on this platform, sister. Okay, that's why I love I love my Thank black you. people on Hidden Truth. And it's not just, and I'm gonna be honest, it's not just black people that tune in. I'm gonna tell you now, we have Asians, we have white people, but our show is aimed without any apology to the black community. But I thank all communities that 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 tune into this show because it's not about it's just for us, but it's I will say it is aimed at black people. But you know what? You know what, brothers and sisters? It's a new day today. We're not begging anyone. We have to stand up and be ourselves. Literally, we, we, we literally crash the website. We sell out all the products already and we want more. Brother Keftusa, are you with us, my king? Jeez. Dr. Keftusa, are you with us? Yes, brother. I'm me. The baby face assassin. Jeez. The doctor of political science. Jeez. Let me, brothers and sisters, doctor, if, if it's your first time to meet this brother, um, he's an historian, a pan-Africanist and cultural scientist who has an astute and profound analysis of the myriad of issues that affect the global African community. He's been lecturing over 20 years. He's been influenced by the greats, Joseph ben, um, ben Yukanen, Dr. Henry Clark, Dr. Milana Karenga, Dr. Amos Wilson, Professor James Small. Some of those people have actually been on our show already. Dr. Keftusa offers his own, though, unique style of presentation and holistic approach to the issues that affect, affect Africans mentally and spiritually. Brothers and sisters, we've got the smooth skin. I don't I think he's probably the smoothest skin. <laughs> oh, my day. Easy, Bridget. <laughs> and remember, I'm not going to get in trouble with your wife, man. But I'm going to say, the sisters, oh are, some of the sisters are coming on because it's you. Some of the oh sisters are coming day. on because so whilst you use your looks, you guide them into knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. <laughs> How are you doing, brother? Yes, sir. Um, how am I sounding? Does it sound good, sir? Brother, you're sounding good. You're looking cool. All right. Good, 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 good. It's, it's all good, brother. It's all, all right, good. All right, and, all right. And as, and as you know, brother, you blew up the system last last time you came on the show. You um And, um yeah, the baby face assassin is here. Oh, my okay. day. Okay. Brother, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shut my mouth, brother. And um, we want you now to take us on that journey. Yes, from sir. Africa yes, sir. To the Caribbean and the triumphantness of African consciousness. So, when you're ready to share your screen and do your own little, little intro, brother, you got over nearly 400 people with laptops on the program. And that means we have a, at least 800 people worldwide listening to you on their tablets and on their phones. And I know this brother, I've known this brother for years. We've, 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 we've traveled up and down Birmingham and all places together teaching the masses. So, brother, I salute you, my king. Yes, sir. And um, it's all yours. OK, welcome. You find yourself in a peaceful place and we wish for you blessings without number. Now, I will say today that I'm in recovery mode, so I'm going to do my best. I just wanted to say a couple of things. Uh, if you want to. Uh, stay in touch with me on Instagram. You can see the details there. And also you can email me on saonk at yahoo.com. I have a lecture series. So if you're interested on getting, getting on my uh, mailing list, then please do that. Now, I wanted to say two things about the Trinidad connection that Brother Andrew was talking about. So Brother Andrew is correct. The, the um, Pan-African Congress, 1921. However, in 1900, Yes. H. Sylvester, H. Sylvester Williams, a Trinidadian lawyer, formed the first Pan-African conference in Westminster, London. So that Trinidad connection that you talked about, sir, is real. It's live and direct. And on another point, um, when I went to Ghana in 1992 for the first time, I met Kwame Toure. What a soldier. Live, what, what, a, what a soldier. I also met Akbar Muhammad too in the um, El Mina and Cape Coast dungeon. So, you know, <laughs> we've got to look at those connections. So, look, I'm going to get into this now. I'm going to just need a slight warm up because I've got to get my energy up. So, just bear with me for one second. Is there any sound there, brother? Oh, there's no sound coming through? No sound. Oh, dear. 
All right, you know what? I'm not even going to mess around with it. I'm not even going to mess around with that. Let me, let me stay in my program. Right, so the first thing that we need to understand is we need to question, who are we? Who are we? And that's important. Why? Because we have to understand that we have been through one of the greatest tragedies that the world has ever seen. And that's why I say we break the chains through the spirit. So many of us think that we are free. But today I'm going to show you that we're not free as we think we are. So what I want to do today is I want to speak today for our noble forebears. Often, many of us, we like to talk about ancient Kemet, uh, Ghana, Mali, Songhai, and we should do all of that. But sometimes we need to remember those Africans, and I'm going to say something controversial. For me, in many ways, those Africans who were brought from Africa to the Caribbean, Brazil, and the Western Hemisphere are some of the greatest Africans that ever lived. Why? Not because of the civilization that they brought, but because of their ability to sustain life so that we could be here today. So I want you to really consider why we don't celebrate those Africans who were enslaved. Now, often when we think about the Caribbean, we, we're given particular types of views. What is Caribbean culture? Let's delve deeper into that. What is your idea of Caribbean culture? Now, my um, parents both come from Jamaica. So that's a very interesting one. We've been talking about the different islands. And one of the things that we need to remember is that through our sojourn in the Caribbean, Africans will move from islands to island. For example, Brother Simon talked about Bookman. Bookman, who was instrumental to the, to the start of the Haitian Revolution, was taken from Jamaica to Haiti because he is a rebellious African. So we've got to understand that when you say that you're a Jamaican or you say you're Trinidadian or you, you say you're, you're Dominican, remember that we were moving from island to island. So ultimately, we are a people that share bonds that we need to reconstruct. One of the key Africans that we need to look at is John Jacques Dessalines. Say that said, again, say <laughs> that again, that's my man. Dessalines said, yeah, for every head they take, we take one of their heads. That's, the, that's why you don't hear about that, brother. Many of us believe that our ancestors were passive, but in truth, when this lecture is done, and this is the first part of today, then we will understand that we have been fed propaganda. So now there's this term that we, we utilize called the Martha. The Martha is a Swahili word, which means great disaster. There's also Imungamizi. And what is the point here? The point here is that this Martha or great disaster did not happen by chance. It was an orchestrated plan. And we need to understand that. And I want to say something to you. Many times, we get caught up into notions that are given to us by the people that brought us to the Western Hemisphere. We need to go into more than history. We need to understand what has happened to us. So let's have a look then. What are pathogens? I'm saying here that the Martha is like a pathogen. What is that? A pathogen is an infectious age agent that causes disease or illness in a host. Now, Thinking clearly, have we been infected by a negative experience that we carry throughout our sojourn through the different generations? The host is the organism in which a parasite or pathogen does damage. So I want us to understand this metaphor. We are carrying a host of behavior patterns that many of us don't even understand. If you want to understand the violence that you currently see amongst the African world, you have to understand what happened to us during the periods of our enslavement. Failing to do that will mean that we can never heal. So what I'm saying here is that if you have a pathogen, then you have a pathology and then things become pathological. 
So I want to ask you, do you see pathological behavior amongst Africans across the globe? So what am I arguing? Africans have been carrying around this virus for centuries. Why have we been carrying it around for centuries? Because we have not put together proper healing protocols. Many of us are running from this discussion because we can't take the pain of the situation. But we must go beyond the pain and reach the level of understanding in order for us to heal ourselves in the current context. Because, Bob, Bob, doctor, Bob, doctor, just one yes, second. Sir. You're, on a, Bob, you're killing it already, you know. <laughs> Bob, 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 doctor, I just want people to appreciate who you are and what you're doing because you're going really deep. I didn't realize you were going to go so deep so quick, okay? Sorry, sir. Uh, no, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. But, Bob, doctor, you're, you're, yes. you're, known, you're known as one of the most militant pan uh -oh. doctors <laughs> in the UK. No, but uh, real talk, Bob. Uh, before you carry on, Bob, yes, sir. You know what? Even though you've reached the height of academia in many yes, sir. as a doctor, okay? Yes, sir. Um, brother, is it not true that you pay a price to teach like this? Oh, brother, it's true. It's, it's true. I've paid a price. You've paid a price. The price of speaking the truth is worth paying, though. Because if we're going to secure the next generation, somebody has to disconnect from the matrix. I don't go in the matrix. That's your thing, brother. But we have to understand that we cannot speak truth to power and there's no consequences. There's always a consequence. But guess what's happening now? We are moving to a stage where we consolidate who we are. We disconnect and we rebuild for ourselves. So that is why I say, History is not enough. I'm not a historian. I look at conceptual frameworks because critical thinking and concepts are key. Unless you can conceptualize being free, you can never be free. So let's look at this concept of pathology. Definition, pathology is the study, logos, of suffering and diseases. Look at that. We have diseases that have occurred because of what happened to us physically, mentally, and spiritually. And guess what? The subconscious mind in many ways is more powerful than the conscious mind, especially if you are actually unaware, consciously unaware of what happened, because everything that happened continues to happen until you stop it. So, this concept of pathology then involves basic medical sciences and clinical practice to investigate the causes of the diseases and the mechanism. So I'm telling you, we have a disease. Part of that disease is called white supremacy. And that disease lives in your mind, in your heart, as well as mine. So we have to begin to be honest about what has happened. In other words, during our movement are, 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 are being taken from Africa. Our DNA was altered, people. Altered. We are not the same people that left Africa. So you got to understand this at a, a genetic level, what has happened to us as a people. So... Point number one, I know some of you won't like this. Caribbean culture was forged out of oppression. I will say it again. Caribbean culture was forged out of oppression. Oppression. So at best, the culture that we grew up in the Caribbean has been infected with the virus of white supremacy. I won't go into it today, but also the issues around self-hate and self-negation, which many of us are in denial about. But let's carry on. So let's look at the geography of the Caribbean. I won't go for all of this, but the Caribbean islands include three geographical areas. The Greater Antilles includes Cuba, Haiti, and the Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, and Jamaica. While the Bahamas extends from Florida to the Greater Antilles, the Lesser Antilles include a string of small islands from the vicinity of Puerto Rico to Trinidad in the south. The Lesser Antilles are subdivided into the Leeward Islands in the north and the Windward Islands in the south. So look at the geography of the K 
Caribbean and understand that we never came there for our own benefit. We were brought there in the hulls of so-called slave ships. Now, there are 34 countries in the Caribbean and 7,000 islands, 43, 43 million people reside in the Caribbean. And remember, whenever we get statistics around our numbers, you can guarantee that those numbers are always cut down. So the, the thing that we need to remember that there are almost 43 to 50 million Africans in the Caribbean. Now, how can we call ourselves minorities? And I want to add to that, my son did some research for me today. There were 91 million Africans in Brazil now, and that was in 19, uh, um, sorry, 2010, when he looked at, when, when, they, when they gave out those stats. 91 million and up to 50 million African-Americans. Do the math, people. We are not a minority. We are people who are confused about who we are. And therefore, because of that confusion, we misidentify ourselves as singular entities instead of recognizing our collective identities as Africans. Now, let's look at what happened when so-called Columbus came to the Caribbean. He met two major groups of people in 1492. The Araks, who inhabited the Greater Antilles, the Bahamas, and parts of Trinidad. The Carib, who inhabited the Lesser Antilles and parts of neighboring South American coast at the time of the Spanish conquest. So those islands were occupied. They were occupied with people. Now, their name, Carib, was given to the Caribbean Sea and is Arakan. I can never say it. equivalent is the origin of the English word cannibal. That's what happens, people. Indigenous people are always portrayed as some negative type of people. They were cannibals, they said. Now, those of us who know recognize that there was an African presence in the Americas before we even came here. The presence of Egyptian style pyramids in Central America suggests an African presence in the Americas. Also, Abu Bakari II, the king of Mali in 1305 to 1307, traveled with 200 canoes down the Senegal River to explore the Atlantic Ocean. He never returned, but is reputed to have traveled to the Americas. So if you wanna get into that science, read Professor Ivan van Sertma, in the book, we came before Columbus. So we were already in the Caribbean before we were brought there as enslaved Africans. You gotta know your history, people. You gotta know your history, but you gotta know your culture. So let's look at the, the key themes that I'm gonna boil down today. It's important that we are prepared to do research because in this research, this is where we find the ability to heal ourselves. Question. Is Caribbean history important to us? Would we benefit from studying Caribbean history? Who are we? This lecture speaks to but transcends Caribbean history. It is about self. The benefit stems from knowing who and what we are. We are divine beings on a quest to discover self. And it is said, what is history? but the cyclical pro pro procession of time as manifested on the earthly plane. Did you hear that? History then is a limited term, but it relates to the social evolution or devolution of men and women. It records the biological, cultural, and spiritual development or regression of man and woman on the physical plane. So history doesn't mean progress. History doesn't mean that. It records the evolution or the devolution going backwards sometime. We have to ask ourselves, have we evolved or are we devolving? Where are we in terms of how we identify ourselves? So let's look at what I call a binary relationship because we should know that mathematics is a, a supreme science. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad talked about supreme wisdom 
And what we're talking about is the mathematics, a binary relationship. What you call history is a living organism. What you call history is a life in you. Your history is encoded within your DNA. Your DNA reaches back to the beginning of our history. So you yourself are a walking history. So you embody the trauma, the tragedy, the victory, the courage, the fear, the accommodation and action of prior generations. That's important for us to understand that because we must understand that consciousness is transferable because the spirit is malleable. In other words, what our ancestors experienced centuries ago still lives within us if we truly understand. That is why when we, we, we think about a woman carrying a baby, whatever happens to that woman affects the fetus and that child and its development. So in many ways, we think we are free because we don't understand the complexity of the issue. Okay, we don't understand it. So the fear, the pain, the betrayal, and the dependence on the master is also within us. In other words, many times you see that the African man and the African woman go at each other. You get on social media, brothers attacking sisters, sisters attacking brothers. Because we were, were forced in some ways to betray each other. Now, there's a very important thing that you have to understand. I'm not going to go into it today, but you've got to understand there are four parts to the brain. The first part is the reptilian part. It's the brain that uh, exists in, in reptiles. The second part is mammalian part. Is the brain that exists in mammals. And then the third part is the um, cerebral cortex, the human brain. And there's a fourth part, which most people, they call the frontal lobe, which hasn't been really developed at this point in time in most people. So what I want us to understand that in many ways, during that Ma'afa, we were forced into reptilian survival mode. So even when you look at the story of Toussaint Overture and the Maroon tradition, you will see it is not as clear as many of us think. Toussaint, when you study his history, he, why did he get captured? Because he believed that the French were good, that he believed that he was part of the French connection. And also in the Maroon tradition, that when the Maroons fought and they would beat the Europeans, often when they made treaties, they would tell the Maroons that you have to capture so-called runaway Africans and bring them back to the plantation. Now, not all of them did that, but you have to understand this was going on. So this idea of collaboration and assimilation is key. That's why they say, all skin folk ain't kin folk. All skin folk ain't kin folk. We have to understand that a germ, a virus was placed into our consciousness. So points for consideration. The African population of the Caribbean are prisoners of war who have lost the knowledge of themselves and lack self-knowledge. We are prisoners of war. Imagine that when our ancestors were taken from Africa, what was the number one thing they wanted, they wanted to go back. They tried to, to they put um, mud in their mouth so that they could carry a, a remembrance of who they were. But many of us, we don't wanna go back. We, we don't even identify as being African. Why? Because we have lost our collective memory on the marches to the coast, the, the so-called slave ships and on the plantations. We wanted to escape and return home. But have we lost that memory? And this is important because the first time I went to Ghana, my mother said to me that my grandfather was uh, a sympathizer with the Honorable Marcus Mosiah Garvey. And that when he came to this country, him and my uncle, my, one of my uncles, wanted to go back to Ghana. And so my mom told me, you are fulfilling 
what your grandfather wanted to do. So never underestimate the fact that you are a returning ancestor who have the ability to, to reforge the reality that our ancestors lived in order that you could clean up the situation. Now, let's be honest, a people who still carry the names of their so-called masters still exist within the enslaved paradigm. And again, I've, I should have said that I don't argue with people. You can believe whatever you want to believe. But the facts of the matter is, is that, and whenever a uh, discussion we want to have about it, we are still carrying the names of the people that enslaved us. And that's an interesting thing, because when I was growing up, when I would hear some of my elders talk about, we got Scottish blood, we got Irish blood, we got this, we got that, but they never said African. So what we need to understand is that there is accommodation, but there is also resistance. We put up a massive resistance. And much of that resistance has been erased from the history books. Dr. John Henrik Clark has said that the people of the Caribbean have the greatest revolutionary history outside of Africa. But we don't know that history. You say, well, people in the Caribbean know it. Okay, maybe. But here's my question. Where does the Caribbean educational system come from? So what we need to understand is that most of us know very little about the real history of the Caribbean. And because we don't know it, we don't teach it to our children. And that's one of the reasons why we see all of this anger in our children. We see the anger, but we don't know where it's coming from. You don't realize that the anger of the things that happened to us centuries ago has never been addressed anywhere systematically in the whole African world. Now, back to the Trinidad connection. According to Professor Clark, the concept of Pan-Africanism was formulated in the Caribbean, mainly by three Trinidadians, H. Sylvester Williams, who I spoke about already, George Padmore, and CLR James. However, the praxis of Pan-Africanism, meaning who, for me, who was the greatest Pan-Africanist? It was the Honorable Marcus Mosiah Garvey. They say in America that Du Bois was the father of Pan-Africanism, but if we look at it from an organizational perspective and the impact, it's the Honorable Marcus Mosiah Garvey. Question, is there one authentic African nation in the Caribbean? If not, then why? Question, is there one or more than one authentic African nation on the continent? And remember, being African doesn't mean being black. I'm talking about your cultural awareness, your worldview, your understanding, your spirituality, your culture. Are we living as Africans? That is the question. So, are you African? If you say yes, then what makes you so? What makes you African? Now, the key thing to understand, you were modified during the Middle Passage on the good ship Jesus. Now, I'm going to say something to us. <laughs> Where in Africa is there a holistic and systematic, legitimized teaching of African spirituality outside of Christianity or Islam? Where? See, we've got to look at these questions and there's a whole other discourse because when I say Islam, I'm not talking about the message to the black man, which is a different thing. That is a message to us. And all of our leaders have been teaching us a message to the black man and woman because they know that we have been in a ditch that we must climb out of. Now understand, some Africans during the so-called middle passage committed suicide, aborted or killed babies born from rape. And I want to say something to us. Oftentimes when we talk about the 
predatory behavior of the slave master, we, we tend to look at it from the perspective of male to female, but you not need to understand male to man, to boy, to young girl. We haven't even dealt with that. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that if the true history of enslavement was taught, it would be enough to make a what? A brass monkey cry. Many black people, you hear them, oh, I forgive, I forgive. You don't even know what you're forgiving. How can you forgive something that you don't even know what happened? So once we got to the Caribbean and the Americas, our diets, our habits were altered drastically. Even some of the food that we say is our article food. Really? What kind of diet did we exist on in the Caribbean? Were we eating the foods that we ate in Africa? So my question to you is then, are you African? And if so, then what makes you African? Now, <clears throat> many people say, where was God during the Middle Passage? But they don't understand we have here from the Yoruba system, Obatala, Ogun, Yemiyar, Isu. We brought the Orishas and Voodoo and the spirit of who we were from Africa to the Caribbean. But if I say the word Voodoo, it's not Voodoo anyway, it's Voodoo. What is your understanding of it? Like most of us, we probably scared of that term because it has been filtered to us through another person's perspective. Juju, what is it? Obia, what is it? Don't you understand that everything about us as Africans was condemned to make us forget who and what we were? And many of us are still in that mindset. Brother Angie said you play a price. I've been learning about African culture and history for many years. And I can tell you, sometimes your, your greatest cri critics will be the people that look like you. They will be the greatest critics you can have. They get angry when we talk about these things. But how can you heal unless you begin to unpack what happened to you? So I want us to understand that we have been transformed. And in that transformation, we have lost. Remember, what did Malcolm said? You said, you ain't lost, you ain't left nothing in Africa. Malcolm said, why you left your mind in Africa? That's what Malcolm said. And here's another thing about Brother Minister Malcolm. Most people say Malcolm's last identity, El Haj Malik El Shabazz. But you know what, Malcolm, when he went to Nigeria, they gave him the word name Omawali, which means the son who has returned home. And Malcolm said it was the greatest honor that he ever received in life. In the 60s, Malcolm already knew that we needed a cultural evolution and a cultural revolution, and we still need it today. So as I said to you, Dr. Clark in his powerful book, Christopher Columbus and the African Holocaust, he says, we have the greatest revolutionary history outside of Africa. So we respect all Africans across the globe, but we who come from the Caribbean must ascend to an understanding of knowing our history and teaching it because we're not second-rate Africans anywhere. So why were the Caribbean so important? Because the conditions on the islands, because of the demographics, allowed us to retain aspects of our culture. So you said, well, you just said we lost it. Yeah, we retained it, but for how long? So we retained aspects of our culture. So you can hear in the um, patois, you can hear the Africans, the African words. But I used to hear my, um, my grand uncle and aunt 
uh, from Wilsdon. I used to go to their house and, and they were big up in age. So when they used to talk Patois, it just sounded African. And I remember talking to, to my grand aunt and I said, wow. I said, that sound like an African language. She said, yeah. And then two seconds later, she said, switch, I'm not African. Because that's part of the conditioning process. To forget who you were. So that brutality led to deep assimilation and the illusion of cultural authenticity. Now, Yimaya, who is the mother in the Yoruba system, Yimaya, Yimaya is, the, is the mother, she's the ocean. As soon as the river, but Yimaya is the ocean. In Kemet, that's all set. In those so-called ships, Yimaya represented the womb. The, those ships were both a womb and a tomb. Why? Because in those ships, many of us died physically, many of us died mentally, and many of us died spiritually. But at the same time, we gave, uh, we had a rebirth as a new people because we realized that in order for us to survive, we needed to come together. Just like how you saw the brothers and sisters in Trinidad coming together collectively to build the um, Kwame Touré Center. Those ships were coffins, brothers and sisters. And in those coffins, there was a loss of memory. There was insecurity. And some of us became pliable and programmed into a culture that was designed to make us forget who we are. Many of us suffer from amnesia. And that's why we don't deal with who we truly are. Many of us say, I'm not even interested. I remember when I came back from Cape Coast and Elmina and I showed some pictures to, to some people in my family and said, I want to see that. I got to go to work on Monday. Because you don't want to deal with the reality of what happened to you. When I went to Elmina and Cape Coast, I found myself because in that resistance, when I went into those dungeons and I could smell and feel the energy of what happened, I knew I could never fail. I said, any group of people that could survive this are some of the greatest people on earth. And I'd said to myself, I cannot fail to reconnect with who I am, no matter what anyone says. So what we're gonna understand this term, epigenetics and culture, trauma and adaptation. Epigenetics is the study of how your behaviors in environment can cause changes that affect the way your genes work. Do you hear me? Changes to your environment and your behaviors that affect the way that your genes work. That's why many of us, we suffer from high blood pressure. Do you think that's just because of your diet or do you think it's the stress of racism? Do you not understand that the pain of, of what happened is still there in our system, but we can't let go of it because we're running from it. Unlike genetic changes, epigenetic changes are reversible and do not change your DNA sequence. Does everybody understand that? So that's why when the Honorable Elijah Muhammad came, he talked about the making of a new people. Garvey talked about that the making of a new people. We were created in the Western hemisphere. And because of that, we had epigenetic modifications, gene regulation. That's why we were bred. They bred us to be strong workers, but not to develop our mind. So the mothers and fathers of civilization were stripped of their knowledge of self, but made into hands, people who were physical, chattel enslavement, made into so-called animals. But at no point were we ever made into slaves. That is why no slave masters in the Caribbean slept easy. None.
So what we have to understand, and we should all have read Joy Larry, post-traumatic slave disorder. Look, Brother Andrew knows, anyone who's been in a car crash or been, let's say you were in a fire when you were 10, do you know that that memory will stay with you even when you're not thinking about it? And at certain times it can be triggered. So significant life-threatening experiences alter genetic coding. And this is in, inheritable in subsequent generations. So in other words, we inherit. We inherit from our parents. So the post-traumatic slave syndrome is a condition that exists when a population has experienced multi-generational trauma. Generations of our children taken from us. Generations of men being created to breed. Many people say, why doesn't a black man want to be in, in stable relationships? Why does he have such a problem? Because the black man was made into a stud. And because we go over that lightly, we haven't taken the time to reverse all of this. And the key thing to understand is that whatever was done to the black man also had an impact on the African woman. So in many ways, we're like mirrors to each other. We've got to understand that. Centuries of slavery continues to, to, to impact on our behavior. We still traumatize people. We are still traumatized. You want to know why are our young people getting together in gangs and killing each other? Because where are our rites of passage systems that we had? What do we teach our children? We have not developed the, the, the system of elders where we teach our children systematically. That's what we're trying to do now. We are traumatized, my people. We are hurt. And we must begin to recognize the truth of that. And that is why black people coming together is so important. Brother Andrew said it. We have to bring a message, yes, to the world. But if it's raining, Make sure you have an umbrella for you before you get an umbrella for anyone else. So one of the things we have to do is rebuild our community because many of us exist in a survival modality. I was talking to a sister, a teacher, who said to me that many of the things, and she's worked in, in London schools for a long time, she said, many of the things you see our children do to each other, they don't do to other people. You say, why were, were black people such great boxers? Because on them plantations, they made us fight one another. They made us whip one another. But they also recognized that after dark, we would come together and we would plot, plot in order to bring justice to a situation. So this survival modality is important because we must move beyond survival. Now, here's a term, homeostasis from the Greek words for same and steady, refers to any process that living things use to actively maintain fairly stable conditions necessary for, vi for survival. Look, people, the black family, the African family has never, never, been safeguarded since we got to the Western Hemisphere. Never. Any success that we've had is because of what we did. Our family structure has been under pressure since we got here. So the key thing to remember is that when our survival is threatened, we retreat to the lower levels of consciousness. In other words, you know, you've ever seen people who get a knowledge of self and they begin to change, they change their diet, like me, I, you know, my biggest hero, Malcolm. Stop drinking, stop smoking, yeah? Change my diet. But you see, people can do all of that. But when a crisis comes that threatens them, 
they can often return back to the behavior patterns, the negative behavior patterns that they had with seeded within them. So what we need to understand is that in order for you to have homeostasis, you must practice a systematic method of gaining a knowledge of self. And it's not just through study. So. Five minutes, brother. Two. All right, sir. So I'm going to stop there because I want to I want to sum up what I have said. Now, what I have said may have shocked some of you and you may. Powerful (laughs) teaching. Thank you, sir. And you may not like what I said, but let me say this to you. One of the reasons why we don't have more people standing up, you always hear black people say, we need more people standing up. But look, if you go to the doctor and the doctor told you you had cancer, do you slap him in the face? No. So when people come and bring truth, if you don't believe it, go and do your research. But I'm telling you, you can talk about ancient Kemet, Ghana, Mali, Songhai, Zimbabwe, Monomatapa. You can do all of that. You can, talk, you can bring all the kingdoms. But here's my question. Which one is closer to your experience? That enslavement period or Kemet? Remember, so-called emancipation, 1838. That was yesterday. Go ask, go back into your family and look at how many generations before you were enslaved. Sorry, how many generations it takes for you to go back to enslavement? What have we done to clean that up? So what I'm saying here is that instead of being angry or upset, we need to understand that history is a living thing. It breathes in your organs. When you have been traumatized, it affects your body. It affects your mind. It affects your behavior. Your culture becomes distorted and our relationships were distorted. We as men were forced into situations sometimes where we could not protect our women or our children. Mothers were forced in situations where they had to do the best to protect their children, but couldn't really do it. What does that do to you? You see, here's the point that I want to leave with us. We are coming into a time now where we must resurrect the God within. There is a God within you. Elijah Muhammad said that the black man was God. Many of you, oh my gosh, what kind of stuff is that? But going to ancient Kemet, what did they say? You were made in the image and likeness of God, that you have the ability. You're not the supreme being, but you have the ability to become the, um, what's the word I'm looking for? The representative of God on earth. You come to the physical plane as a human to go through the cycle where you can become God. And what I mean by that is where you resurrect yourself through a knowledge of who you are. We have been lost from that knowledge. And what I want to say to us is this, we are living in a time where we have the ability to change history. And I want to say to Brother Andrew, if you study the modern um, liberation movement, you will find it tends to move in 30 year cycles. Ain't got time to go into it, 30 year cycles. We're in another cycle now. This is time to resurrect the teachings of who we are. And it's only through a knowledge of self. If you have a knowledge of self, you'll understand economics. If you have a knowledge of self, you understand diet. If you have a knowledge of self, you understand culture. If you have a knowledge of self, you understand spirituality. And I wanna end with this. One of the reasons why I got into this, a trauma that I had when I was about 17, I had a friend, A. Moser, his name was, I won't go into details, He was going out with a beautiful sister from Kenton. Beautiful, I mean. mm. And one day I was with him and he gave me a book on Marcus Garvey and I read it. First, so the first person that gave me a book on Marcus Garvey was Caucasian. So when we were reasoning about the book on Marcus Garvey, this is what he said to me. Even though he had a black girlfriend, he said, while 
the black man was copulating and he said the F word when while the black man was copulating, the white man was creating civilization. And the pain of that statement was so deep, I never had an answer. That's why it was painful, because I never had an answer. And I remember after I went to America and I came back and I saw him, I never had to say a word. And that is the beauty of knowing who you, you are, because I promised myself that my children would never be as ignorant as I was, not knowing who I was. And with that, Brother Andrew, I say peace, Assalamu alaikum, hotep, hetep, shalom, shalom, and all those good things. Wow, wow, wow. Brothers and sisters, Dr. Keftusa. Oh my gosh, brother. I can't read out the comments. I can't read out. I'm hoping that your wife is reading out the comments. Brother, <laughs> wow. This, brother, you made it personal. Uh, you, 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 you kind of, you know, upset the apple cart. You made us think. You made yes, us value. You. you made us reflect. Um, there were a few questions for you, brother. But boy, um, brother boss says this is powerful in capital letters. Um, uh, how long says we need the doctor back again? I know that. Don't worry. Me and him have been in discussions behind the scenes. Um, Elaine Bailey says. Deeply interesting. Thank you very much. Mm. Um, Simon Mohammed from Trinidad says, awesome teaching, brother. Um, oh boy. Julia, is it Julia Mosley says, oh, no, too short. We need you back again. Um, Elaine Bailey says, uh, makes a lot of sense. And, so, oh, brother, I just can't. It's just too much. Too much, brother, too much. Oh, my God. Um, Sister Glasmin, who's my beautiful sister, always emails us back with um, feedback on today. She said, this is a master class in history. Oh, wow, wow, wow. Brothers and sisters, what a night. Um, sheer brilliance is another term given. We need more from Sister Marcia. Oh, wow, wow, wow. Brothers and sisters, this is what Healing Truth's about. You can't say there's not a platform at least once a week that you can't find inspiration, motivation, and education. This is one of our top doctors in the UK. And I'm telling you, man, he's been very, very humble. If you see the kind of fight he has to put on in the academia, just to be able, how many doctors in the UK can you see speak like this, brother? How many? You know what I'm saying, brothers and sisters? So you know that there's scars, battle scars all over this brother. But look at him, man. The brother looks pretty. The brother <laughs> looks young. The brother ain't got no, no creases. I mean, he goes to sleep at night. Do, do gaga. Yeah. You know what I mean? He's sleeping good. You know what I'm trying to say, brothers and sisters? And um, um, black don't crack, someone just stated. <laughs> Can I say something, please, brother Andrew, very quickly, sir? Come on, King. Look. I want to explain something to people. Before I became a doctor, I gained knowledge of self. Believe it or not, Brother Andrew is one of my teachers. We've taught each other. And I'm a student of Elijah Muhammad, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, Marcus Garvey, Noble Juali, Professor James Smalls. Uh, Dr. Ben, I take my inspiration from my ancestors. And that is who I was speaking for today. It's an honor. I don't really love to go into this subject because of the pain it used to cause me. But I go into the subject in order to cleanse from that pain. I have no anger or hatred in, min in me. But I'm here on my assignment to teach the truth to Come those... On who are willing to learn, but I'm also forever a student. And that's why I want to thank Brother Andrew, because when I first met him, you know, in many ways he saved me because I was going through a crisis. Because when you have this kind of knowledge, but you're amongst people that have no respect for this kind of knowledge and that see you as dangerous. And I want to end on this note. The most dangerous black man and woman is not the so-called thugs that they describe. 
it is the educated black man and woman. And when Come I say on. educated, I mean those with a knowledge of self. Come we on. are the most dangerous Africans on the planet. And what we now have to realize is that we can peacefully reconstruct our world one brick at a time. And the first foundation is remember that when they built the pyramids, they built into the ground the foundations before they built above the ground. So we go in within ourselves to find the truth, to bring it to our people so that we can resurrect and find the God, take the God from a horizontal level to a perpendicular upright on the square and 90 degree angle. Jeez. Brothers and sisters, Dr. Kef Tusa is in the house. Now, brothers, there's one or two things I want you to do. We, we still got nearly 400 of you on the platform with laptops. I'm not including those of you on tablets, my dear, okay? If you want this brother, and I'm being serious now, <laughs> if you want this brother back on my platform on another theme, put down in this chat room right now, blouse and skirt, please. If you want this brother on this platform, platform, I, I'm not going to do it unless I see some blouse and skirts <laughs> in this platform, Bridget, because I want to know, am I wasting my time? Mm. I don't want to invite the brother. The brother's got a very busy schedule. You understand this, brother? Says, I can't bring the brother back if you don't want him back. I need to see some blouse and skirts for the most pan-Africanist militant doctor here uh -oh. in the UK. <laughs> so militant, yet yeah, skin looks supple. You know what I'm saying, Bredwin? Okay. Oh, my All days. Right. Got some blouse and skirts. All right, then. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm hearing you, brothers and sisters. And um, brothers and sisters, if you felt tonight, if you felt tonight, all I'm going to say is, ja, finish it off for me. If you felt tonight, <laughs> all I'm going to say is, ja, and you can finish it off for me, brothers and sisters. Yeah? Let me know if you understand what I mean by that. Ja, and you finish it off for me, man, because, ja, we're calling our ancestors in here tonight. The brother took us through an analytical, pathological, Jesus, pathological journey. The bubble went into viruses. You know what I'm trying to say, brothers and sisters? Viruses that we probably didn't even know that we had. The bubble was dealing with some science here, brothers and sisters. And all I can say is, cha, Rastafari. My God, brother, we thank you from the Hidden Truth platform. Um, brother, if people want to know more about you or get to know more about you, where, where do they go, King? Yes, sir. So I've got the uh, Instagram um up here and the email so you can email me or join me on instagram uh, as i said i'll be restarting my lecture program i've got a lot of stuff coming uh, I'm, I'm really working on a book i've written books before but i gotta write an african-centered book that's my thing it's not a book unless it's, it's me so uh, anyone that wants to uh, assist in that please get in touch, let's move forward. And again, let's give a round of applause for brother Andrew Muhammad, who is so unselfish that he brings other people and allows them to shine. I had a teacher in America and he always used to tell me, everybody needs their time to shine. Don't be selfish, allow our movement to move forward by bringing in the missing pieces, those 14 pieces of the body of a ser that will oh. come together and create the body of the God. And that's the Godhood, which is collective. Blam, blam. Boom. In the house. Brother is the man. The brother is the man. Brother, if you can come off stop share screen, please. Yes, sir. Thank you, my king. Brother, what a night tonight. Uh, um, brothers and sisters, if you want a copy of tonight's program, you know, hook us up. We're going to be giving it on. Subscribe to my YouTube channel. Yeah, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Or if you're on my emailing list, you're going to be getting it. But brothers and sisters, tonight, we had one of the greatest doctors here in the UK that can literally, pound for pound, go with our brothers and sisters in America. Pound for pound with our brothers and sisters in America. Brothers and sisters, this was the hidden truth. This is Dr. Keftusa. Look at the beauty of this brother. 
Look at the damn beauty. Allah's blessed him. You can't say, I, I can't stand the brother because look how pretty Allah made him. You can't say the brother's too damn ugly because look how pretty the brother Allah's made him. You can't say the brother's out of shape. He needs to go in the gym. Look how pretty Allah has made him. Jeez, thunder, thunder in the house tonight. Dr. Kef Tusa, brothers and sisters, we also must give a shout out to the Hulk, the Hulk of, um, of Trinidad. The Hulk of Trinidad was in the house, brothers and sisters. Enough love to brother Simon Mohammed. Brother Simon Mohammed, absolutely love this brother. And I'm um, seeing that what he's been doing for how many years? How many years, brothers and sisters? How many years? So, brothers and sisters, that's the Hulk in Trinidad. Um, brothers and sisters, you know my special guest tonight is our Professor Earl Taylor, former Senator of the Jamaican government, Jamaican consulate, 